Wonderful. Um, thanks again for having me. Uh, this is Giant Work with Matt Kudran, who's now at Nestquex and the University of Maryland. Um, okay, so the plan for this talk is going to be, I'm gonna introduce hybrid quantum computation, talk about the conjectures of Aronson and Joseph, state our main result, talk about the valid tree problem, which is at the core of our result, give a sketch of our proof and end with some open problems. Uh, fairly straightforward for the theory talk, so nothing crazy there. Uh, before I get started, feel free to ask clarifying questions during the talk. So if I say something that's confusing, like don't hesitate. Uh, I don't know if there is some sort of raise hand here, but you can unmute and start talking. That's okay. Um, but please reserve comments till the end. I have a tendency to go off on tangents and there have been many instances where I've not finished a talk. So I'm gonna try to avoid that now. Oh, oh yeah, also, um, if anyone doesn't want to be recorded, they can also ask the question in chat and then I will just uh, interrupt Senkat and relay the question uh, when I yep. read it. That works fine as well. Um, and yeah, keep your unmute button handy. I'm, I'm hoping to keep this a little interactive like to the real world, but let's see how that goes. And finally, there's a recorded version of the stock uh, by my co-author co Matt from Stock. So if you want to polish your QRP submission or something, feel free to go for it. And I, I assume there's gonna be recording of this as well. So this is great. So you have the flexibility. Okay, uh, before we get started, a uh, quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of hybrid models before? Or are already convinced that they're useful? So you can either raise your hand or wave and zoom, uh, like the reaction or something. Okay, so it seems like, like that's a relatively small number of you. So I'm gonna start by motivating these models and then we're gonna get into the, why we care, get into why, get into what we show, excuse me. It's still, it's still early morning for us here. So uh, to excuse my not being too awake. So first fault tolerant quantum computing is expensive. So uh, Craig Gidney recently tweeted this and he does a slightly bigger picture. So if you assume like, 0.1% error rate, surface code, and all of that, then a quantum NAND gate looks like this. And this is what a regular NAND looks like. So it seems like in the like the near future, like maybe 10, 20 years, we're not going to have a fully quantum iPhone. So what we're gonna have is something I assume would look something like this. So you have your main classical chip and you have a quantum coprocessor. So you'd be outsourcing some computation to the coprocessor. Now, again, we are theorists, so we want to try to, at least I, I am a theorist, and I assume most of you care about theory here. Um, we're going to try to idealize this model. So let's just say, for this model to make sense, we should have our classical chip be more powerful than the quantum one, right? Because if, say both of these are, both of these, so if the classical chip was BPP and the quantum chip was PQP, then we don't need this main classical chip, we can just throw it away. So for this architecture to be idealized, we'd, we'd want the coprocessor to be weaker. So for now, I'm just gonna say, like, you know, pull a number out of my hat. I'm gonna say this quantum coprocessor has like, I don't know, can do polylog depth quantum computations. And the main classical chip can do any polynomial time computation. So just to quickly reiterate, this can do a polynomial time computation and this can do a polynomial, de uh, sorry, polynomial size, but polylog depth. So your depth is constrained. The reason I'm making this assumption is that like this, these gates seem, seem to take longer. So you may only be able to do polylog depth before like your state is incoherent or whatever. Uh, and also I'm gonna make two important assumptions here. Again, this is for theoretical reasons. Uh, there is some motivation from the real world, but again, it's not, I, I'm, I'm hand waving here. It's not like, I, it's not like I'm in the lab, I'm like examining things or something. It's just to make things convenient. I'm gonna assume all communication here is classical. This is a classical chip, so it can only send bit strings and it only gets bit strings, nothing quantum here. And I'm also gonna assume that this coprocessor has no persistent quantum RAM. Now this is, the, I'm making this assumption purely for theoretical reasons. So if I assume that there was no persistent quantum RAM, then this becomes stateless. But if I had persistent quantum RAM, uh, again, theoretically speaking, the issue is you can just, this quantum coprocessor just keeps working on this quantum RAM and say I can do polylog depth, but say I can do it for polynomial number of turns, then it, again, you get BQP. So we want to keep this model interesting. So I'm gonna assume there is no persistent quantum RAM. Uh, but if you, 
but like there are versions of this question that you can think about with persistent quantum RAM, which is interesting. Uh, again, this is a motivation. This is not the model. I'm going to specify the model more uh, formally in a second. Uh, and another motivation is purely theoretical. So uh, back in 2000, Cleveland Waters showed that Shor's algorithm can be adapted to this model, where you have polynomial time, classical pre and post processing. And in the middle, you only do a polylog depth computation. So this is really low depth, right? This is a low depth quantum computation. Uh, the key idea is like you can do your Fourier transform very, really quickly. And you do your Fourier transform, do your uh, period finding, and you're fine. Uh, indeed, they show that this can be made just order of log n, not even polylog. Uh, we just enter the five on either end. Uh, but again, like I said, this is like any resemblance to the real world is coincidental. Like uh, this algorithm of Cleveland Waters isn't very practical. Because, for instance, here they don't have any constraint like nearest neighbor, so you're so they assume like the first wire can connect to the last wire or something, and that is hard to do in practice. So I'm going to leave practice for this slide. So from here, everything is theory. So I hope you're fine with that. Okay, so uh, there are also a bunch of theoretical considerations uh, that inspired our approach, which is which were the con conjectures of Anson and Joseph. Uh, these two like. Again, historically speaking, Matt and I were not motivated by these conjectures, uh, but they're you know they're interesting. They might be they might, uh, and, and they add some credibility to our results. So we're going to state them anywhere. So the main question that these conjectures address is how much can we parallelize quantum computation? So with classical and quantum classical pre and post processing, can they be generically parallelized? In other words, can we take any random BQP computation and turn it into this form? And I, I don't know like what your intuition is at this point. Like, does it, does, what do you think? Do you think this is possible? Like, you know, raise your hand if you think this is possible. Okay, raise your hand if you think this is not possible. <laughs> okay, so um, what Joseph conjectured was that it is possible. So he said that there is. Uh, that any polynomial time quantum algorithm can be implemented with only order of log n quantum layers interspersed with polynomial time classical computation. So I'm going to uh, sh show an image of this for you. So if the circuit is not clear, don't worry. But he basically said that you can generically parallelize quantum computation. Uh, Adamson made a, a conjecture in the other direction. He said it's, that there exists an oracle such that this is not possible. Uh, this is like, again, we can't, show this directly, right? Because BQP and BPP to the BQNC are both contained in P space and both are contained P. So to actually separate them would require us to separate P from P space. And I can't do that now. Uh, so, and yeah, BQNC here, sorry, is the class of problems that can be solved with polylogarithmic depth quantum circuits. Um, again, I'm gonna show you this to you in a second and clarify it. If anything's confusing, don't worry. Um, Okay, so I wanna quickly get some no notation going. Uh, I know this is not great notation, but I'm gonna to try to make it better by using colors. So I'm going to use purple and have these boxes represent polylogarithmic depth, polynomial size quantum circuits. And I'm going to have these pink boxes represent polynomial size classical circuits. Um, and I'm going to assume that each quantum tier, I'm gonna call this a quantum tier, and it's a classical tier. I'm going to assume that each quantum tier is composed of polylogarithmically many depth one quantum circuits called quantum layers. So here I use this notation quantum layer. That is what I mean by a quantum layer. It's a depth one quantum circuit. Um, okay, so uh, the asterisk here is like an Easter egg for the end. So I'm not going to talk about BPP to the BKNC because this is a little unwieldy. Like, because a BKNC oracle is something that is that takes an n-bit input and produces a one-bit output. I'm instead going to define a, a new complexity class called HQC uh, to capture circuits of this form. So you have like poly-depth quantum circuits interleaved with poly-size classical circuits and on and on polynomial number of times. And again, communication here is classical. So each of these is stateless. They take an n-bit input, produces an n-bit output. Uh, is this model clear? Do you have any questions about this model? 
Okay, cool. Um, and yeah, notice that here, since the quantum circuits are pi log depth, take n bit input and an n bit output, this captures BPP to the BQNC. So we can just simulate uh, BPP to the BQNC by just forcing this to just have one bit outputs. Cool. Uh, and I'm gonna state your system uh, This slide is totally optional. So if you get lost, don't worry. Uh, this model is a bit uh, unwieldy. Uh, in fact, it's so unwieldy uh, that the original version of our paper misunderstood Joseph's conjecture and Joseph emailed us like the morning of the archive announcement saying, this is not my conjecture. So, uh, so what Joseph meant was, I'm gonna capture this using uh, a class of circuits called JQC. So it looks like this. Now, uh, this picture might not make it obvious, I'm gonna to try to explain it in plain words. So let's take an end bit all zero state here, all zero quantum state, and I'm gonna split it into two registers, R1 and R2. And I'm gonna define a quantum oper operation to be a quantum layer, which is a depth one quantum circuit on both these registers. And I'm gonna define a classical operation to be a classical basis measurement followed by a classical circuit of polynomial size. So this is a classical operation, which is a measurement followed by a classical circuit and a quantum operation, which is a quantum layer on both these registers. And I do this polylog times. So I have a quantum operation, classical operation, quantum operation, classical operation, and so on. So does this model make sense? Cool, uh, I'm not gonna talk about it again. Uh, this is just for the slide. Uh, if this is of interest to you, please talk to me after the talk or read the paper or get in touch with, touch with Joseph. This model has been very understudied, like it's only mentioned in a few papers. So there's a lot of interesting questions here. And yes, it's uh, as this measurement, this is inspired by measurement based quantum computing. So if you're familiar with that, then this model isn't so wacky. Uh, but to me, it is because I'm not familiar with that. Okay, this, so here's some questions. In this picture, the printed in negative, it's talking about black boxes and white light boxes. And the legenda seems to be quite the opposite of what I'm seeing. Yes, uh, that is a typo. <laughs> I, uh, the, I took the, I inverted this because the slide is negative, the slide is dark. Uh, so yes, the light boxes <laughs> represent classical circuits and the dark boxes represent quantum circuits. Good catch, thank you. Uh, I should have been more mindful of that. Okay, so I'm gonna put our work into the context of uh, quantum complexity theory now. So as I mentioned, P contains HQC, which contains PQP, which contains P space. So we cannot hope to unconditionally separate these classes without proving P not equal to P space. So let's try for an oracle separation. Right, like this is what we've been doing since kindergarten. We like we try to solve problems, we can't solve them, so we go for oracle separations. Um, so, for starters, let's start with like the four oracle problems again that we learned in like our first complexity class, our first quantum computing class. Uh, so, Winston was Rani, Dyke, Joseph, Simon, and correlation. Uh, so, correlation is a little esoteric, so you may not have seen it in your first uh, quantum computing class, but it's like think of it as like a version of Simon's that is more quantum. I'm gonna show that to you in a second. Is there anyone here who hasn't heard of these first three problems? Or are these all like clear to you? Okay, cool, so great. So there's one problem with these problems, which is that, sorry, I'm using problem a lot, which is that they all admit uh, constant depth quantum algorithms. So like, if you go back, Simon's algorithm, like the quantum part looks like this, you have a two n bit quantum state, you've had them at the first half, you apply your black box, you had them at the first half and measure. And you do this in parallel a bunch of times to get your uh, soundness and completeness. So why, so there is no like, there's no adaptivity here. So, and, and for relation is similar. So for relation has a similar part where instead of where you don't have these zeros, just hard them out your n bits, apply the black box to the n bits, and then hard them out them and measure. And that's what for relation is. And for relation is supposed to be BQP complete, like in, in the sense of Oracle problems. So if you can do like a 
quote unquote BKP complete Oracle problem in this depth one model, maybe Joseph was right. Maybe Aronson didn't read his original correlation paper when he made that, made that conjecture. Like it seems plausible that all of quantum computing could be done with very low depth. Uh, but I mean, as it turns out, I lied uh, because else I wouldn't have his paper. So there is another Oracle problem we consider, uh, one that wasn't mentioned here and one that is usually not covered in a quantum computing class, which is this problem, the value tree problem of Giles, Cleve, Diodor, Farhi, Gutman, and Spielman. I don't know why I said all those names, but we have it. Uh, so this problem, like its claim to fame is that quantum walks can give you an exponential speed up over classical algorithms. Now, I'm gonna define what a quantum walk is, or maybe like give you some intuition for what a quantum walk is in a second. But for now, think of a quantum walk like Grover's algorithm. So you know how in a Grover's algorithm, you have a quantum state, and then you do like a tilting and rotation, tilt, rotation, tilt, rotation. And you're, you have to keep your quantum state coherent for the entire duration. So like if, so, if you measure in the middle of Grover, like your whole progress is lost. Uh, and that's kind of what a quantum walk is. And indeed what I said can be formalized. But again, let's take a step back. Like if the best way to solve the value tree problem quantumly, moreover, if it's the only way uh, to solve the value tree problem quantumly is to use a quantum block where like you need a quantum state and you need to keep it coherent for poly, poly n steps. Then we won, right? Because if you have like a grower type algorithm, then it cannot be done in HQC where like, where in HQC, if you go back here, you have to measure every poly n step. So you can't keep a state coherent for more than poly log depth. But you can't do Grover in this model, for instance, right? Because if you keep measuring, it's done. But okay, so I just said you can do, can't do Grover. Why can't I just use Grover for my separation here? Like, does, does anyone have an insight here? Why am I using this valid tree problem? Why not just Grover? Okay. Uh, so, okay. Yes, I guess it's polynomial speed up for Grover and not exponential or not. Yep, exactly. So you can't get an Oracle separation with just a polynomial speed up. So, and there is no obvious way to like recursively put Grover. So you get like an exponential speed up. So for instance, Bernstein was running like the actual problem only gives you a polynomial speed up, but you can recursively do it a bunch of times to get you a super polynomial speed up. There is no obvious way to do that with Grover. So we have to use like a more esoteric problem like the value tree, which has a structure like Grover, but you can't measure in the middle, but it gives you an exponential speed up. So our main result is that there exists an Oracle such that the value tree problem is not an HQC. And as I mentioned earlier, Childs et al. showed that the value tree problem is in BQP. So we get an Oracle such that BQP is not an HQC. And this is what we wanted, right? And this is a good point for me to pause and mention that this result was independently and concurrently obtained by, excuse me for butchering these names, uh, Nash Nai Chia, Kai Min Shuang, and Xing Yi Lai. Uh, their paper ap appeared in stock alongside ours. Uh, they use an approach that's different than ours. They use something called a, uh, actually I don't remember the name of the problem now, but it's a composed version of Simon's problem. And the, and the and if you're trying to improve on this result, or if you're trying to generalize our result, I recommend that you read both papers. For instance, there was a paper uh, recently which tried to prove a query complexity version of our result, and they found this approach by Chia et al. to be more amenable to that. So yeah, so I recommend that you take a look at both papers. Cool. Um, okay, so here I state the main result. I used a lot of notation. So I'm gonna state it with less notation now. So the main result is that there is no quantum algorithm with Oracle access to the random validatory Oracle using only polylog depth quantum circuits, alternated, i.e. circuits of this form, alternated with polynomial time class computations, polynomially many times can solve the validatory Oracle problem with probability greater than uh, one over exponential. And again, this is, uh, I wanna keep emphasizing this. The communication here is classical. Uh, so you have like a, polynomial size bit string that comes out here that is given to the circuit, polynomial size bit string given to the circuit and so on. Uh, is the result clear? Does anyone have any questions at this point? 
Okay, cool. I'm going to move forward now and and mention the Bellatrix Oracle problem. So, okay, so I have a so Matt and I had this question of, like when we started looking at this. Has anyone seen this graph, but not in the context of the Bellatrix problem? Okay, so how many of you have seen this graph before? Okay, cool. Um, so this is you take. This looks weird, but like I'm going to explain it in a, in a second, and it should be clear. So you take two binary trees of height n. So this is a binary tree. This is a binary tree, and you weld them together with a random cycle. So this is uh, so this is not a matching here. Uh, so matching is where you take one vertex and connect it to another. This is a cycle. So like, think of it as like a cycle that goes. So one way of creating a cycle is you just go around like this, right? That's a cycle. But we don't want a vertex here to touch another vertex here. So we go like, this is equivalent to doing something like this. So you go like this. And then at the end, you go back up. Now, one reason we like cycles here is because everything here has degree three. So every internal node in this graph has degree three. So these are the only vertices that don't have degree three. So this is degree three. And this is degree three because it's connected to two vertices here. And also there's another property that comes up uh, because of this, which is useful. So I'm going to mention that in a second. Uh, as I mentioned, notice that these are the only vertices, the entrance and the exit. Uh, the only the roots of the trees are degree two. Actually, uh, before I go forward, is everybody familiar with the notion of degrees? Is like, is that fine? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm also going to interchangeably use like the uh, words vertex and node. They mean the same thing. Don't be confused. I, I took a graph theory class and then I took a CS class and CS people call it nodes, graph theory people call it vertices. So like my brain is messed up. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna give each vertex a random two n bit label. Now, can anyone guess why I give it a two n bit label? So they're clearly the two n vertices, two to the n vertices here, two to the n vertices here. So n plus one bit labels should be fine, right? But why a two n bit label? Like why have a larger space? Okay, so uh, 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 the idea is, if I give it an n bit label, you can guess, like if you randomly flip coins, the label that you get is a valid label. But if I pick two n bit labels, then you can't guess the label of a valid vertex because the proportion of two n bit labels that are valid is one over exponential. And this is a property that's very useful when you're proving uh, lower bounds, so with graphs. And that'll come in handy when you prove a lower bound. So yeah, this is a trick that, you should, that if you were interested in this field to keep in mind. Okay, so. Good question, Amy. So um, if you pick, a, if you just use like n plus one labels and you would pick a random node, then it would still be pretty close to the middle with high probability. Wouldn't that be sufficient? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that question? So instead of taking two n bits, if you just take like uh, n plus one bits mm -hmm. and you guess a random label, then still you're going to be with higher probability close to the center. Of the yes. Uh, that is not sufficient for us here. We want it to be very hard to just guess a valid label, not just one in the middle. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Yep. But that's a good observation. Yes. If you only want it to be like you can't just guess the exit, then yes, it's sufficient to. Uh, just have n plus one bit, and then you can't just guess the exit vertex, but you can still guess a random uh, label in the middle. Cool. Um, going forward, as I mentioned, this is an Oracle problem. So the only way to access this graph would be through a black box. And I'm going to define the black box to be a neighbor function. Also, just to be clear, all of this is from the Charles et al. paper. There's nothing new here. Uh, this neighbor function, excuse me, if I give it a valid vertex, label, it gives me a neighbor. And if I give it an invalid vertex label, it gives me invalid. Invalid here is the all one string. For simplicity, I'm going to assume that the all one string is not used for a vertex label. And see here is an edge color. This is, again, this is like a random, this is uh, just for convenience. There's nothing like nothing that's useful that comes from the edge color. It just makes it easy for us to do the math. So for now, I'm just going to fix like a random nine coloring. The only thing that's important here is that the number of colors is constant. 
So actually, for that, has any does anyone know this track? Like, how do you how do a nine edge color this graph? Is that okay? I'm going to mention this track because it's cool and useful if you're doing um, stuff like this. So, okay, let's just start with this vertex. I'm going to give this the label A, and then I'm going to enumerate its neighbors in some random order. Okay, this and this. So I'm going to label them one and two, and I'm going to call then this edge becomes a1, this becomes A2. This is label one. Again, I'm going to enumerate them. I'm going to give these vertices. So this already has A. So I'm going to label these B and C. So this becomes 1B, 1C, and so on. So if you have a, a graph that is at most degree three, you can label it with nine colors, like label edges with nine colors. So, so if you have like a random node here, you just enumerate all nine colors and you can get all the vertices. Um, and quantumly, we just turn this black box into unitary in the regular way. And yeah, so I've alluded to this before, but the problem is the follows. You're given the entrance vertex, the label of the entrance vertex, and black box access to this article, and you need to find the exit vertex. Uh, and yeah, you can tell that a given vertex is the exit using the property I mentioned before, that the exit is the only vertex that is not the entrance that has degree two. And as I alluded to earlier, you can compute the number of neighbors with just order one queries, just nine queries, and you know how many neighbors it has. Uh, is the problem clear? Cool. Um, so Childs et al. show that this problem is in BQP. And the algorithm is a carefully orchestrated quantum walk, which I'm going to totally butcher and give you the, uh, the kindergarten version, which is like not accurate, but it kind of makes sense. Just, just, start with the superposition over the entrance vertex and you just walk. Uh, it's more, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but this is the intuition. Um, and Charles et al. also give like a classical lower bound where they show that this problem is not in P. Uh, I'm not gonna redo this proof, but I'm going to give you some intuition here. So let's say we use the following uh, obvious algorithm to try to go to the exit. We're gonna try to do it with a random walk. So random walk starting from entrance would be you flip a coin and you pick a random neighbor. So let's say I flip a coin, I pick this neighbor. I flip a coin, I pick this neighbor. Flip a coin, pick this, flip a coin, pick this. And now at this stage, I have two neighbors, one that goes here and one that goes here. And with 50% probability, I'm gonna go back, right? Okay, so say I go front. Again, I have 50% probability of going front and going back. So a random walk that starts at the entrance will most likely get caught in the cycle and it won't reach the exit, like assuming n is polynomially large. At each stage here, it, uh, it has like 50% probability of turning back. So it's not, so a random walk on this graph will not be able to reach the exit. And you can show more generally that any uh, classical algorithm cannot reach the exit in some poly, uh, with polynomial number of steps. Uh, more formally, here's the theorem uh, due to Charles et al. with improvements by Fern and Zhang. They show that any classical algorithm, uh, when I say random value tree, it means that these vertices labels are picked randomly and they have two n bit size. Um, that makes at most two to the n over three queries outputs the correct answer with probability at most one over exponential. So classical algorithms do not succeed here. Uh, is, is all of this clear? Like it's the main result of Childs there at this point? Wonderful. Um, so I'm gonna go off to go on to like our proof now. So all of this is stuff that is covered in the Childs paper and Fenner and Zhang's paper. There's nothing new here. So here's like our theorem again. So we show that the value tree problem is not in HQC. And the way we're gonna do this is using the following idea. We're gonna assume to its contradiction that the value tree problem is in HQC. That is, there is an algorithm that has this form that solves the value tree problem. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna give a classical simulation algorithm for this. And the classical simulation algorithm will only make sub-exponential queries. Moreover, these are gonna be sub-exponential classical queries. And then we're gonna get a contradiction with the existing classical lower bound because this classical lower bound says, no algorithm should be able to do this with two to the end of, with less than two to the n over three classical queries. So is this idea clear? Okay. Um, 
so the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm just going to be focusing on the classical simulation part. So I'm going to assume that there exists a circuit of this form, and I'm going to classically simulate it. So when simulating a quantum pair, we can keep track of the exponentially large classical description of the quantum state and simulate all quantum gates accurately. So I'm going to assume there is some Clifford plus T and I can simulate it with some exponentially higher probability. But is this clear? Like is, I'm going to use like an exponential classical simulation here. Okay, so uh, why, uh, why is this okay? Why is it okay for me to have an exponential classical simulation here? This is, okay, I'm gonna, the answer is we only care about queries here. We don't care about the circuit complexity. So it's fine for our simulation to be insanely inefficient. Okay, so if I can keep track of the exponentially large state and simulate all quantum gates, then why isn't the problem solved? Like what, what, what is not trivial here? You have superposition queries, so you touch the whole thing at the same time. Exactly. So if I make any superposition queries, then I can't just simulate it, right? Like imagine I make a query over all two n bed strings. To classically simulate that, I would need to make two to the two n queries, and that would just that won't let us have the classical simulation, have only sub-exponential queries, we just lose it. So we wanna make sure that the number of queries is sub-exponential. So, okay, so let's think about this for a second. So say someone makes a superposition query over all two and bed strings. I said you cannot simulate it accurately, but can you simulate it with like some precision? Is that possible? Using an idea I mentioned before. Okay, I'm gonna give the answer now because uh, the key insight is that since the chance that you can guess a valid vertex label is exponentially small, if, if you query a vertex that is not known, that's not the result of a previous query, then the chance that you actually knew that that was a vertex is exponentially small. So like if you go back to querying all two and bit strings, since only one over exponential fraction of them won't written invalid, if you just assume that it's invalid, then that state that you get is exponentially close to the true state, right? Is that is that insight clear? Uh, so what we do is we keep track of all the vertices that are written by the black box and only execute queries on those vertices. But the rest, we just assume the result in, is invalid. Okay. Uh, and this simulation produces a state which is exponentially close to the true state output by the quantum circuit. So is this insight clear? If you have any questions, if you want me to pause and repeat, that's okay. This is one of the two ideas in our papers. So it's, it's quite important. And so, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Like the, um, why is this classical then now here in that case, the KT? You Sorry, could you repeat the question? You just have a classical list of values returned by this black box, KT? Yes. And why is it classical? So uh, uh, we're gonna class, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to try to classically simulate this uh, hybrid quantum circuit. So let's just, do recursion, right? We're going to assume you simulated the first i tiers, and we assume I have a vt, and now I'm going to classically simulate q2. So let's say I classically simulated q0 and c1. I'm going to classically simulate q2. I'm given a classical list of uh, vertices, and I'm going to simulate it using a classical algorithm that makes classical queries. So okay. the input to this classical simulator is it's going to get a circuit description of q2, an exponential size circuit description, and I'm going to simulate it. Is that clear? Wonderful. So this is, again, this insight is just, uh, it seems kind of naive. It's just by design. We designed an algorithm, so it's hard to guess a vertex. So we're gonna, so it seems like this is trivial, right? Like this is from here, it should be, like this shouldn't be enough. 
So let's try to, but let's try to just use this. Let's try to create an algorithm based on just this one simple idea. So suppose at the beginning of quantum TRI, we have some V known, which is a set of known vertices. As I mentioned, the idea is we're going to be doing some recursion. So we're going to assume V know till QI. So we have some classical set of known vertices V known. And towards the worst case, let's suppose that at every vertex, uh, in Vinon is queried in the first quantum layer. So in the first quantum layer, let's say you query all the vertices. Then each, the notice that suppose I have a vertex here, which is like the light blue circle. The number of new vertices is these dark blue circles. So it adds at most three new vertices to the new known set. Again, I'm assuming the worst case here. So the new Vinon after a quantum layer is four times the Vinon that we started with. So in, since each, gear, each quantum tier has polylog and quantum layers, each quantum tier increases the number of known vertices by a factor of four to the polylog n. So you start with some uh, v-known and at the end, the size of v-known is four times polylog n, the original size. And this approach already allows us to simulate one tier and it also allows us to simulate up to root n tiers. So you get something that is four to the eta times D, so D here is the polylog and I mentioned earlier. So you get a simulation algorithm that is exponential in both the number of tiers and the depth. But since the depth is polylog, it's fine. So this already gives us a result that works for like root n tiers. This is great, right? Like we all, uh, and indeed using just this idea, we can disprove Joseph's conjecture. So if you recall in Joseph's conjecture, there are only order of uh, polylog and quantum tiers, so like eta is polylog and D is constant. So this gives you a simulation algorithm for any Joseph circuit. So this is uh, great, right? Like with just one idea, we, we got like half the, half the conjecture solved. Uh, is this clear? Okay, I'm gonna move forward now. Um, but the problem is in this approach, each each new quantum tier increases the size of explored vertices by a multiplicative factor, right? Like this is bad because it's like, we don't want eta to be in the exponent. We don't want the number of tiers to be exponential. We want to get this data out. We don't want it to be multiplicatively increasing it. So we want to make this some sort of additive factor or something like that. So the problem is with this bound, like I said, the number of explored vertices quickly becomes exponential and it trivializes our bound for any super linear number of tiers. So you can't simulate say n tiers. So if eta here is n, then we're, we lost the game, right? Because this is exponential. So we need another idea to get over this. Okay, so in the previous argument, I mentioned that after root n tiers, the number of known vertices becomes exponential. But notice that there is no persistent state here. And the communication, as I mentioned, as I mentioned way too many times already, is a polynomial length classical bit string, right? And if say Q2 knows about an exponential number of vertices, it shouldn't be able to tell C3 that with just a polynomial size bit string, right? Like there has to be some information theory bound here. Like you shouldn't be able to fit like a super polynomial amount of information into one bit string. And that's the idea we use. But before I go there, I wanna, make a simplification here. Excuse me, I'm gonna assume that all the tiers are quantum. So I'm gonna take each classical tier. Uh, again, this is for technical simpli simplification. I'm gonna assume that this is just say it's, uh, each classical tier is just like a bunch of uh, quantum tiers because I just turned this classical circuit into a quantum circuit where I measure every, uh, measure every order and steps. Is that fine? So I, I can simulate a classical circuit with a with polynomial number of quantum circuits where I measure every polylog. Uh, is that clear? I, I said it in a terrible way. Uh, so if, suppose this is made of NAND gates or something, I can just turn them into Toffley and Clifford and classically simulate it. Okay. Clifford and T, excuse me, that was bad gate set. So I'm gonna assume going forward that all tiers are quantum. Uh, I hope this is clear. Okay, so the key insight here, as I mentioned earlier, is that each tier can only tell the next tier about a polynomial number of vertices. And moreover, 
these vertices can be inferred from the classical bit string that's output here. And maybe let's just say for simple, let's also add some auxiliary information, which is the number of vertices that were known beforehand or something. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some sort of a hybrid argument. So if you have uh, done hybrid arguments in cryptography, this is gonna seem very familiar. We're just going to, let's just say each of these outputs a classical bit string. I'm just going to change like vertex labels such that these bit strings remain the same. So I'm gonna keep doing that over and over till I prune the set of vertices. Uh, that's the key, that's the idea here. Uh, is, that, is that idea clear? I'm gonna say it more formally in a second, but it's the idea makes sense. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna say this more formally again in the next slide, but at a high level, suppose that we fix a seed of some polynomial times polynomial, such that the simulation of some quantum PRI takes the, takes like the IGN bits of seed. So like each quantum pair, it's a, it takes some seed, it takes the classical description and it uh, produces a string SI. And here, each of these produces a string, like this produces S0, this produces S1, S2, S3, and so on. And all of these are classical best strings. Um, and what we want to do, as I mentioned earlier, is we want to change the vertex. We want to remove vertices from being on that would not change the classical best strings that are produced. So this is like a hybrid argument, right? We want to uh, change the oracle while making sure that none of these bit strings change. More formally, what we're gonna do is, we're going to take the probability over all black boxes, like pro probability over all labeling. So if you think of V, you can think of V known as defining a labeling in this vertex, right? Like say you know this vertex, you know that it has this label. So now I can't change the label of this vertex. I can't change the label of this vertex. I definitely can't change the label of the entrance vertex because you'll definitely know that I've changed that. But I can, change maybe the label of this vertex that he created like in some Q1 with some very low probability. So that's what I do, right? Like I change all vertices, which make sure that none of these classical bit strings change. Like I look at the set of all labelings that are consistent with the current output, right? And I just, uh, does this make sense? Is this, is this, is this, is this too obvious or is this like uh, too confusing? I'm not sure. Because like it's, if you've done cryptography, this seems like obvious. If you've not done cryptography, this might seem like not obvious. So I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna go forward then. Uh, please feel free to ask if there are any questions because this is like uh, a new idea if you've not done cryptography. So, Here's the pseudocode for how to do this. Like, how do you prune the set of known vertices? Uh, as expected, with this new insight, we're able to bound the number of queries to be polynomial in the number of tiers. So I had eta in the exponent before, but now I got, so here I'm using k. Uh, I got k to be in front. So k is now, so even if k is polynomial, you're fine here because it's not in the exponent. And with this insight, we're able to show that the value tree problem is not in HQC. And this resolves Adams' conjecture uh, that there exists an oracle such that BQP is not in BPP to the BKNC. And using similar ideas, we're also able to resolve Jesus' conjecture. Uh, okay, so on to open problems. So let's go back to Adams' conjecture. So I, I said Adams' conjecture has an asterisk. So the conjecture of Adamson was stated in this blog post um, where he says the following. He says, incidentally, it's not hard to give an article separation between BQP and BPP to the BQNC. But the question is whether there is any concrete function instantiating such an article. Uh, but again, every time I mention this to people, they're like, oh, but how is this a paper then if Aronson said it's not heard? Aronson later clarified that while it's possible, it's, it hasn't been done. So this is, this is still like a non-trivial problem. <laughs> so we make, we give a more concrete conjecture. We say that, Assuming post-quantum classical indistinguishable deobfuscation, if you don't know what this is, think of it as like a way to turn a, a circuit into a black box. That's not really true, but that's basically equivalent by a result of like Goldwasser and Rathplum. So um, if you haven't heard of it, maybe Google it. It's, you might find it helpful, like written theory, like knowing this 
idea of indistinguishably obfuscation is kind of useful. Um, so we say that if you assume post-quantum indistinguishably obfuscation, we ask, is it possible to produce a family of random valetary black boxes so you can instantiate our separation? So this doesn't seem trivial. I've thought about this for like a week. Um, but if you're interested, I, I'd suggest that you start by reading this paper by Amit Sahai and Brent Waters, uh, How to Use Indistinguishability Obfuscation, which defines something called the punch it program technique. And I feel it might be useful here. And this would be really cool because then you would get this result without any oracles. You'd be able to say, oh, assuming uh, post quantum indistinguishability obfuscation, you'd be able to do this. Uh, right now, their indistinguishability obfuscation is like a really, really cool cryptographic primitive. Uh, so there's no, it's not like based on LWE or anything. It's like it's cooler than homomorphic encryption. So like the best way to base it on is something called circular security. So it's, I guess it's more concrete than what we have, but it might not be. I don't know. Uh, another open problem is concer concerning hybrid quantum attacks on crypto. So here we showed that hybrid algorithms aren't great at simulating quantum walk algorithms. So one can show a similar result for Grover because Grover is a form of quantum walk. Can we use this, these results to improve crypto analysis? So uh, more, uh, more generally, is there like a non-trivial hybrid generic pretty mesh attack on AES? So right now, the best generic pre mesh attacks on AES use Grover's algorithm. So is there a way to prove, like, to say something like, oh, you can't do this in a hybrid way, like you cannot parallelize. This might be useful in crypto analysis. Similarly, Tani's algorithm, which is used uh, for claw finding attacks. So claw finding attacks are useful to break another crypto system called Psyc, uh, super singularized isogeny key exchange. Uh, again, you don't need to care about how it works. There is like, it has elliptic curves and everything, but at the end of the day, to break it, you have to solve a graph problem. And that graph problem uh, turns out the best way to solve it is using quantum walks. So can we prove lower bounds there? So that might be useful in the crypto analysis of psych. Uh, I, I wrote a blog post on this. So if you're interested, I recommend looking at that. And finally, like going back to the original motivation, I think we just solved the simplest problem here. We just showed that generic quantum computation cannot be solved in a hybrid fashion. But there might still, still be many interesting problems that have hybrid algorithms. So uh, like, you know, like we looked at the complexity side of things, but the algorithm side of things is still wide open. So Jack and Kidney, for instance, started looking into this, this earlier this year using uh, in, the, in their paper offloading quantum computation by superposition masking. Uh, but more generally, it'd be nice to have like more techniques and more algorithms in this hybrid model, right? Like there's the famous like Cleve Waters example, but I'd like to have more examples when I present this talk again, hopefully. Uh, so that's the end. Uh, you can find this talk at this link in maybe an hour. Um, Thank you.